Chris, and we're so glad that you would gather with us today on online services and be a part of our worship services over the weekend. We support every month a mission partner, and this month we're going to be supporting Advice and Aid, which is a crisis pregnancy center here in town. They're in need of size 5 and 6 diapers and all sizes of pull-ups. These need to be new, unopened packages, and you can drop them off at the church, or you can bring them on Sundays if you come in person and put them in the missions bin. And then we'll also have a no-contact drop-off on Saturday, April the 24th, from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. in the church parking lot. And we'll look forward to seeing you then. Also, this coming Saturday, we want to invite any who can come to work on our property on the outside of the building. It's springtime and it's time for a spring cleanup. So we hope you'll gather with us and we'll enjoy the fellowship and enjoy seeing one another after a long time of being separated. So that's this Saturday, April the 17th from 9 o'clock to 11 a.m. I look forward to being with you then. And also today is the Lord's Day. We gather every week to hear him speak to us and we're reminded of our need and desperate need of Christ. Well, today we begin a new series on the life of David, and we'll be learning what it means to be a person after God's own heart. But today we want to hear the story of how we've rejected God's kingship. We so often don't want to wait on God's provision. And the lesson we need to learn is that God is to be king over our lives. Our call to worship this morning reminds us of God's place in our hearts. It's to show us the true posture of our heart. It comes from Psalm 24, so let's recite this together. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory.
where we continue now with our confession of faith and assurance of pardon. Confession of our sin before the Lord and the acknowledgement that he has pardoned us because of what Christ has done. So let's confess our sin together. O sovereign God, we acknowledge and confess that we are guilty of pride and unbelief and neglect to seek you in our daily lives. And we've been timid disciples, afraid of putting our lives on the line for the good of your reign on the earth. Forgive our prayerless days, our poverty of love, our sloth in the heavenly race, our wasted hours in our unspent opportunities. We have sought comfort in possessions, prestige, and power, and we've tried to save our lives by building our own little kingdoms. Yet you call us to find life in laying down our lives for your eternal kingdom. And we ask your forgiveness and seek the renewal of our covenant with you. Conform us to the image of our Savior, Jesus, that we may bring you glory. Through Christ we pray. Amen. And now here are the assurance of pardon, the scriptures that remind us that we are a forgiven people. It comes from Micah chapter 7. It says, Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but you delight to show mercy, and you will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Praise God. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, as we gather today, we want to cling to those words that remind us that our sins are truly forgiven and that you cast them away and never count them against us again because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. So, Father, as we hear those words this morning and as we hear your word preached to us, would you remind us of your grace and mercy, that it would excite our hearts to have been in your presence. And then because we've been in your presence, would it show it as the, in the way that we go and work tomorrow and whatever we do this week for we know that every day is a day to worship you and we worship you through our work and our leisure and our play and our rest and father we just pray that you would use us as your kingdom people to continue to proclaim your kingdom news and to see your kingdom flourish here on earth as it does in heaven and father we thank you that you give us the opportunity to pray for one another so we lift up those that are sick among us, those that are fighting battles of illnesses and diseases, those that are struggling uh, in their marriages, those that are dealing with the difficulties at work or possibly even losing their job. We thank you, Lord, that you minister to us in these times and you provide all that we need. So would you lift up those that need you? Would your peace that passes all understanding comfort their hearts? And would your healing hand be upon all those in our church family that are suffering? And may they sense your presence with us and with them today. And Father, we thank you that as we gather for worship, you speak to us and you have a desire for us to hear your word and to go and do it. So would that happen in our lives and may the power of your Holy Spirit move in us, making us more and more like Jesus. We pray this as your son has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. About a week ago, my wife Lauren and I were taking our walk, our evening walk, and we got to a place where we suddenly were hit in the face with a horrible rancid smell. We looked at each other just wondering, what is that? It smelled like something was rotting or something was decomposing. Well, we just kept walking on our walk and, and we just kind of forgot about it. And then the next day, at the same time, we were out 
on our walk. And we get to the same place and that smell overwhelms us. Again, it smells like something is rotting. It smelled like something died. And we're wondering, is there a dead animal? What is that smell? It was horrible. But we just continued on our walk again. Well, the next day, we were out on our walk, came to the same place, and that smelled overwhelmed us. And we started getting concerned, like it smelled like something died. In fact, one of the houses near this particular place, we realized we haven't seen any activity there. And our, our imagination just started spinning and turning and just wondering, what is that? Well, we were walking and talking about this. And, and then something in the back of my mind triggered. And it was this, it was, isn't there something during the springtime where something blooms and there's a horrible smell? And I was thinking about it. I'm like, yes, there is. And there we were next to a tree and we grabbed one of the tree's blooms, one of its flowers and smelled it. And that was this horrible rancid smell. It was a Bradford pear tree. Yeah, those of you who know what I'm talking about, you know this smell. It is not pleasant. And it smells like something is rotting. And I was taken by this, not to pick on the Bradford pear tree because it is beautiful in the springtime. But here's the deal. It's this beautiful tree on the outside, but it smells really, really bad. Not only does it smell really, really bad, but it doesn't even bear any fruit. It's beautiful on the outside, but it stinks and it doesn't bear fruit. Why do I tell you that? Well, as Jesus followers, we can sometimes go through life and we might look good and beautiful on the outside, but we may be people who maybe are offensive to others. We may just stink and we may not bear fruit. Jesus says that good trees bear good fruit, but bad trees bear bad fruit, rotten fruit. And we want to be a people as we follow after Jesus, who bear fruit, who bear good fruit. And for us to be those kinds of people, we need, listen to this, to be people who are after God's own heart. That's what we want to be. We want to be after and in pursuit of God's heart. And so we come to this new series we're in called After God's Own Heart. It's a series about the life of David because this is who David was. Scripture tells us that David was after God's own heart. David pursued God. He had a, a love and loyalty to God. And so we want to take the next several weeks and dive deep into this story. There is so much in this particular story, the story of David. And it's going to teach us how to pursue God's heart so that we can be people who bear fruit in this world. That God could use us for kingdom impact. And so we need to begin where the story begins. It's when Israel requests a king. They want a king. And so I'm going to read for us from 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 9, and then I'll pray, and then we'll dive in. Listen to these words from 1 Samuel chapter 8. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also joined to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we ask that by the power of your Spirit, you would open up our minds so that we might know more of you. We ask that you would open up our hearts so that we might grow in deeper love for you and open up our hands so that we might go and serve you and love those you put in our path. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we begin this series, we've got to look at Israel's request for a king. That's really where it begins. For us to understand David's life, we've got to begin here. It's almost the prequel to the story because the story is all about Israel's desire for a king. 
And when I say that, what it's actually pointing to is it's your desire, my desire for a king. And you're going to see that as we move through this passage together. And so it is a cry for a king. And there's two points under that heading. And it's simply this, a faithless people and a faithful king. A faithless people and a faithful king. And so first, a faithless people. Let me give you a little background here. The first seven chapters of Samuel, we see that Samuel is this powerful prophet. And we see how God is using him. And God's using him in such a way to bring victory uh, over the Philistines. And you see the way that God is at work. But here, in this particular passage, even after all that Samuel has done, the, the elders of Israel come to Samuel and they say, Sam, you're getting old. It, it might be time for retirement. And here's the deal. We don't like your plan because you put your sons in charge. And your sons, well, they're corrupt. They take bribes. And this is what it says. It's verse 5. Behold, you, Samuel, are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. This is shocking for Samuel. They come to him and say, we want a king. It's shocking to him for two reasons. The first is this, Samuel takes it personal, right? Wouldn't you, when somebody comes to you and criticizes you and says, you're not doing a good job and we don't like your plan. We want another plan. We want a king. And Samuel takes it so personal. It, this is criticism. He's being criticized and none of us like to be criticized. But here's what I want you to take away. And it's kind of a side point in this message. And it's simply this, how does Samuel respond? Does he lash out? Does he defend himself? Does he begin to criticize them? No. Do you see what it says? It just simply says that he prayed to the Lord. What if we were those kinds of people? What if when somebody comes to us and criticizes us, that rather than lashing out, rather than being defensive, we take a deep breath, we pause, and we pray to the Lord. We come before him and we ask him for help and for clarity and for wisdom. That's what Samuel does. But here's the other reason it was shocking is Samuel's shocked that they're asking for a king. But here's what we've got to understand is this shouldn't be that shocking because back in Genesis, God promises that out of Abraham and Jacob, kings would come. In fact, it's in the book of Deuteronomy that Moses writes these words. Listen carefully. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. God had a way. He wanted to do this. He's faithful to his promises. He promised that kings would come, but he has a way. He wants to do it a way that is good and wise for his people. But the shocking thing about this, it was Israel's motive behind it. Listen to what it says. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the other nations. They want to be like the rest of the world. They want to do it the way everybody else is doing it. How many times has that gotten us in trouble? As followers of Jesus, we just want to do it the way the world does it. It never ends well because God is good and wise and loving. He knows best. But the Israelites here in this moment, they're saying, God, thank you very much but no thanks. We want to do it the way we want to do it. You are not enough, God. And this is what is so shocking. It's this motive. The request isn't bad in itself, but the motive behind it. Scripture tells us that we're not to be uh, conformed to the patterns of this world, but to be transformed by the renewal of our mind, by God's word. Or another translation is we're not to be squeezed into the world's mold. And that's what Israel is looking for. They want to be squeezed in by the mold of the world. And so they come to Samuel and they say, we want a king, but we want it because all the other nations want it. What they're actually looking for is they want a king that can bring to them prosperity, protection, and they want a king that can bring fulfillment. They're looking for them to be a prosperous nation, for them to be a protected nation, for them to be fulfilled again, not bad, but they're putting all of that on a king rather than on God himself. And God says, no, I have another way of doing this. And Samuel is overwhelmed by this. 
And what we see is the Israelites come to him and they are not coming with a robust faith asking for God's power and plan to come. No, they come with faithless hearts saying, God, we don't need your power or your plan. We've got it under control. We're going to use our power and our plan. And this is what it says. This is verse six, just the first part of it. Listen how this happens. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. Or the message translation puts it this way. When Samuel heard their demand, give us a king to rule us, he was crushed. How awful. They wanted a king that they could see, a king with flesh. How often do we want this? We can't see God. We can't see Jesus as we follow him. And we sometimes just want to pick somebody or something that we can see and follow and put our hope and our trust in. That's what they're after. And what does it say? It says that Samuel is displeased. And the way the message puts it, it says that he's crushed. How awful. I have this sense of when Lauren and I are walking and we were just overwhelmed with that nasty smell. And here is this tree that looks good but it has a nasty smell and is fruitless. And what Samuel is realizing as he hears this request come to him, and it's this, that God's people are fruitless and they're faithless. This is not a faithful people following after God. No, they're fruitless, they're, they're faithless. And Samuel is overwhelmed with grief. He's crushed is how the message paraphrase puts it because he knows that God is to be their true king. He's to be the one they hope in, the one they trust in. And it's as if God's people are saying to God, God, thanks so much for getting us this far. It's really great to have you as a safety net. It's good to know that you're kind of there in the background if we need you, but here's the deal. We don't think we need you. We've got it under control. Like we know what we're doing. We've got some power, we've got a plan, and uh, we've got enough money, we've got success, we've got our jobs, we've got health, we've got all these things. So God, if you could just be a safety net, that would be good. But other than that, we're going to do it the way we want to do it. And watch the way the Lord comes to Samuel, the way he answers this request. This is verses 7 and 8. Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them, according to all the deeds that they have done. From the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me, listen to this, and serving other gods. So they are also doing to you. Here, the Lord is saying that their safety and security, their hope and their happiness, their faith and their trust isn't in me. And what God says is they're putting their faith, their trust, their hope, their happiness, their safety and security in other gods, in small kings, some lowercase k kings. They're putting their hope and their happiness, their faith and their trust in idols. That's the word that scripture uses again and again. That's what's going on here. They want to put a king up on a pedestal in order to find their safety, security, hope, happiness. And they're going to put their faith and trust in that king rather than in God himself. Let me give you an illustration of what this looks like. So just a little bit ago, my family went to this amazing place. It was an indoor adventure park. And in this, there was all sorts of things to climb through and to go on. And um, there were, was a climbing wall. There were rope, uh, ropes course, all these amazing things. Well, my son and I, one of my sons and I, decided to go on the ropes course. It was a three-story tall ropes course. And I was super excited about this because in the middle of the ropes course, at the very top, there was a zip line. Well, my son Jude is in front of me and he goes and he just tears up to the, the very top of this ropes course. And you're harnessed in with a super secure rope that actually goes up to a bar. And so you are always secure on this rope and this that's in the bar. And so you, you, you just kind of go around the track. Well, he runs up to the very top of this ropes course and I just follow him and I'm going, okay, I'm cool, I'm, I'm good. And as we get to the third story, I'm looking down and I can feel my heart beating. I can feel the sweat starting to come and I'm going, what did I get myself into? Well, we get to the first kind of part of this ropes course and it's a straight up balancing beam that is three stories off the ground. Yeah, you heard me. And I watch my son and he just goes right on down it and he just walks right across. And I'm going, oh my goodness, I. 
I don't know what to do. The rest of my family is looking at me. Jude's already on to the next part, heading to the zip line. And here I am overwhelmed with fear because I'm thinking I got to balance myself on this balancing beam. Everything in me wanted to just go sit down and shimmy across this balancing beam and just hold tightly to it and move across it. Well, I didn't because my family was there and Jude was there and I needed to look like the dad, like I had it all together. And so I closed my eyes, took a deep breath, opened my eyes, and I went for it. But here's what I noticed. Take a look at this video. So that's Jude going across that balancing beam. Do you see what he's doing? He's putting all of his weight on that rope. Here's the key. The key is to trust the rope. That's where the safety and security is. That's where the joy and the happiness is. That's where the freedom is. But I wanted to cling to that balancing beam. I wanted to shimmy across it like I had it all together rather than trusting the rope, the thing that was actually anchored above me. And that's what the Israelites were doing. Rather than trusting the rope of God's faithfulness, holding on to God's faithfulness and his promises, they decided to shimmy across the balancing beam because they thought they could do it with their effort and their strength. And what they were saying is, God, we reject your kingship and we want our own king. And here's the remarkable thing about it. The most fascinating thing about this passage is that the Lord actually gives them what they're looking for. Listen to this. This is verse nine. Now then obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Here's what's amazing is the Lord actually gives them what they want. And by doing that, it's an act of judgment exposing their foolishness and their faithlessness. Have you ever prayed for something and God never gave you what you prayed for? But as time went on, you realize, oh my goodness, God gave me exactly what I needed because if I would have gotten that job, if I would have uh, been in that relationship, if this would have happened in my life, it would have actually destroyed my life. I wouldn't have been able to handle those things. And then have you ever actually gotten something that you prayed about or something that you really wanted, but you knew it was maybe not the best. And as you're going on, what you realize is God uses it to reveal to you your foolishness and your faithlessness in order to move you closer to his heart. And God is giving his people over to his judgment. And he is telling them and showing them, I'm a better king, but I'm going to give this to you because they're saying to God, God, we don't want your kingship. We've got this under control, as we said. And we want to do what we want to do. I want to define myself in my life the way I want to define myself because I want freedom. It's all about freedom. It's this quest we all have from the very beginning in the garden of autonomy, of freedom. And we see this at work in our lives. We see this at work in our culture. Mark Sayers, who is a pastor and a cultural commentator, writes this. It's so good. He says, the whole of contemporary Western culture, from the structure of our malls and cities to the very fabric of the internet and social media platforms like YouTube and Facebook and Instagram, are ideologies that shape us toward a vision not rooted in the eternal, not rooted in the kingship of God, but in the unlimited freedom and pleasure of the individual. We think that by rejecting God as our king, we actually get all this freedom. But what we begin to see what the text shows us as we move through this story is no, when you reject God as your king, what you get is not freedom, but you get tyranny. I want to read a little bit further, and this is further down in the passage in 1 Samuel 8. Here are these words from 1 Samuel 8. This is um, verses 10 through 18. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. 
That word take appears six times. And so here, the Lord is saying, you're going to try to find a king, but here's what's going to happen. You think you're going to find that freedom you're looking for? You think you're going to find the safety and security and hope and happiness that you're looking for? But no, what you're going to find is actually somebody who just takes and takes and takes. What you're going to find is a tyrant that takes, that takes everything. You think you're going to engage your life by seeking this king, but you will end up being enslaved. And here's the point for us, the principle for us, is each one of us, we were made to be ruled by something. We were made to submit to, to somebody else's rule. We were made to bow, to kneel before something. And here's what we do, is in our longing and desire for freedom, in our longing and desire for safety and security and hope and happiness, we set up little kings in our lives, things that we think will give us that the safety, security, hope, and happiness. It may be success, not a bad thing to pursue, but when it becomes the king of your life, you pursue it not in a way where you're just driven by success, but you are enslaved by success. Everything comes around your success, and you begin to make decisions about how can I be successful, and the relationships in your life and the family in your life begin to take back seat as you pursue success, or maybe, Maybe it's acceptance. You just want to be accepted. You want people to like you. You want to be a people pleaser. And what ends up happening is you're enslaved by that. You don't even know who you are anymore. Rather than having freedom by having everybody like you, you're enslaved by the sense of, I don't even know who I am because I'm always trying to please somebody. Or maybe it's money and you're just trying to get more and more and more and you make sacrifices to get as much as you can. Or you buy things you don't have the money for and now you're enslaved to debt. Or maybe it's physical appetites, the things in our life that if I just get that drink, if I just can eat those things, if I can just look at that thing I know is not good for me, if I can just do these things, then I'll get that relief, get that comfort. And some of those things aren't bad at first, but after the third, fourth, fifth, sixth drink, something happens, you become enslaved. The thing you thought would bring freedom ends up enslaving you. The thing you thought would engage your life enslaves your life. And you are enslaved and exhausted. Those are the little kings in our lives. Here's the deal. You were made to be ruled by someone. I was made to be ruled by someone. And we're always looking to, the, to something to bow to, to center our life upon as our king. My family loves superhero movies. We love them because we love superheroes and the bad guys and the superpowers and the tights and the battles and all of it. It's just awesome. We love it. And The Avengers is a movie about 10 years ago, um, kind of the pinnacle of superhero movies. Awesome movie. But every now and then in these really fun kind of blockbuster movies, there's some really smart writing because it gets at the heart of human nature. And there's this one place in the movie where Loki, who's the big bad guy, and he um, is trying to take over the world. That's what all the big bad guys are trying to do. And he's intimidating a crowd of people. And listen to how this scene unfolds. He says, kneel before me. I said, kneel. And he slams his scepter on the ground, intimidating them. And then listen to this. Is not this simpler? Is this not your natural state? It's the unspoken truth of humanity that you crave subjugation. The bright lure of freedom diminishes your life's joy in a mad scramble for power, for identity. You were made to be ruled. In the end, you will always kneel. We're looking for a king. Each one of us is looking for something to rule over us. And so the question is, will we have a king who is God himself, the one who is all wise, all loving, all powerful, the one who is good, a good king, or will we settle for a lesser king who takes and takes and takes and in the end becomes a tyrant? And so we have to choose what kind of king we want because there's only one king that will bring that safety and security we're looking for. And if we choose the wrong kings, rather than getting what we're wanting, that safety and security, we end up being moving from subjects in to servants because that king takes and takes and takes. Verse 18 here says, In that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. That passage is so ominous, and the question is, is there any hope? 
But God is up to something. In the midst of the twists and turns of the history of Israel, in the midst of the twists and turns of their sin and their faithlessness, in the midst of all the changes and transitions and seasons, God is up to something because God is faithful. And so we see that Israel is a faithless people, but we see a faithful king. Samuel actually, just a few chapters later, recounts the old stories of God's faithfulness, of how God has taken horrible things and faithlessness of his people, and how he has been faithful and has worked out good things. Because it's in 1 Samuel 12 that Samuel is thinking through these stories, recounting God's faithfulness, and it's there that he is moving and transitioning the, the nation of Israel from his leadership from being this powerful prophet to the age of kingship. And this is what he says to the people of Israel during this transition. It's 1 Samuel 12, verses 20 through 22. And Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside after empty things. Those are idols. Those are kings of our own making that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Samuel is saying, don't be afraid. He's telling the Israelites, serve the Lord with all your heart. Don't seek after idols. Don't seek after empty things. Don't pursue security and safety and hope and happiness in anything other than God. You are his people. He's never going to leave you. And he's saying, essentially, there's going to be some twists and turns along the way through this desire for a king. There's going to be a lot, but in the midst of the twists and turns of your sinfulness and faithlessness, in the midst of the twists and turns of the circumstances of life, of the seasons and changes and transitions of life, God is working something out. God is faithful. And we then launch in to the kingship age of Israel. We know the first king is Saul, and he looked great on the outside like a Bradford pear tree, but he had no fruit. He didn't have any fruit. And then David, we come to the one we're going to look at over the next several weeks. David is one who is after God's own heart. He is one who was filled with love and loyalty towards the Lord. But here's the thing about David. He's a walking contradiction, isn't he? Scripture says he's a man of blood. He was a convicted adulterer and murderer. And he had family drama that would rival any reality TV show. He, in many ways, was an absolute mess. And we have the most on David's life than anybody else in Scripture. And here's the amazing thing about David, is David, not only do we know about his life, but we have his songs, his poetry, essentially his journal. And as we read those in the book of Psalms, it's always pointing us to something. It's pointing us to God's faithfulness in the twists and turns of life, in the twists and turns of our sinfulness and selfishness and the twists and turns of Israel's history because God is up to something. So Psalm 23, it's one of David's songs. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That is his desire. And then the Psalm right after that is where we're gonna close out. It's Psalm 24, it's what called us into worship today. Because Psalm 24, we get a glimpse of this king, this king we are all looking for and searching for. Listen to this, this is from Psalm 24. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors. That's Jerusalem, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. It's this great picture in Psalm 24 that David wrote of a king riding in to Jerusalem through those gates. Well, we know just a couple weeks ago what we remembered during Palm Sunday, and it's this, that Jesus, the true faithful king, rode in through those gates, but not with a chariot, not with horses, not with an army, but on a donkey in order to receive a crown of thorns, in order to be enthroned upon a cross. And Jesus didn't come to take and take and take like a tyrant, but Jesus came to give. And Jesus said, the Son of Man 
came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus said, I came to give eternal life so that you won't perish. I came to give you life, to give you life abundantly. Jesus came to give us freedom, not to enslave us, but to free us. And he says that the one who the Son of Man sets free is free indeed. Do you want to know freedom? Make Jesus Christ your king. That's where freedom comes. And Jesus says, if you are exhausted because you've been enslaved by those little kings for far too long, Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary in labor, who are heavy laden with burdens, come to me and I will give you rest for your soul because I am gentle and humble in heart. I've come to give, not to take. That's what Jesus is saying. That's who he is. And so here's where this is all going. Here's the point and here's how we begin the series. We become people who are after God's own heart because he came after ours first. He came after your heart and my heart and the person and work of Jesus. And Jesus says, if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit because apart from you can't do anything. We won't just look pretty on the outside and smell. No, we will bear fruit, lasting fruit, fruit that this world needs, fruit that comes from the very spirit of God in our lives. Don't you want that? That's who we want to become. But how do we get that? How do we become people who are after God's own heart? Well, we have to trust the rope. We have to hold on to that rope, that rope of salvation that is grounded in eternity, in the eternal faithfulness of God. And so friends, we may be a faithless people, but he is a faithful king. And he comes and pursues our heart so that we might be made into people who are after his heart, so we might bear fruit. He is faithful. And through all of the twists and turns of our lives, through our sinfulness, through our faithlessness, through all the twists and turns of change and transition of all the various seasons and circumstances of life, the great assurance is that God is faithful and he is always working out his purposes. And so trust the rope, hold on to him because it is anchored in the eternal faithfulness of God. He is always, always faithful. Amen. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are the one who sent Jesus Christ, who is our true faithful King. It's not about how much faith we have, but it's about us admitting our need, that we've been trying to operate out of our own strength, out of our own security, looking for hope and happiness and all sorts of things. but. We know that it's in Jesus that all of those things are found. And so today, for anybody who might not be trusting you, or maybe they're trusting you with certain parts and areas of their lives, we pray that today would be the day we trust everything to you, our entire life, and we hold and trust the rope of your faithfulness. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning by morning to find the power and comfort of God's hand in mine. Season by season, I watch Him amazed in awe of the mystery of His perfect ways. All I have need of His hand been faithful to me. And I can't remember a trial or a pain. He did not recycle to bring me gain I can't remember one single regret in serving God only in trusting His hand all I have need of His hand will provide He's always been faithful 
character is unchanging. You can know his faithfulness in your life today by trusting in Jesus, by submitting to him. Scripture tells us that there's a day coming where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But today you can bow before him. You can submit your life to him as your king. That's where the security and safety is and the hope and the happiness. It's where the freedom and the joy is. And so, for our benediction, let us go in confidence, trusting God's unfailing love and His faithfulness, knowing that He will never leave us nor forsake us. And let us, by the power of His Spirit, bear fruit for His kingdom, loving and serving Him for His glory. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.